here's Ned under the wire. You still want to do that? Ned's here. Hmm? Okay. That's okay. We, we were going to do minutes, but now that you're here, we'll just move on. With the Good evening. The um, January 28th, 2020 meeting of the Beverly Planning Board is called to order. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, Matt, are you um, requesting permission to tape? What's that? Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay, you're all being filmed, so best behavior again. Um, there are sign-up sheets over there. We're asking people if they wish to speak on anything. There's a separate sheet for Depot Square. Um, you do not have to sign the sheet in order to uh, speak, but it helps us have a sense of how many people, that sort of thing. There's a separate sheet for the other matters that are on the agenda. So if you're so inclined, we'd ask you to, to sign up. Um, do we have any subdivision plans? No. <laughs> okay. Could I have a motion to recess for public hearings, please? Motion by Ms. Flannery, seconded by Mr. Besh. Discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion passes. We're now in public hearings. Our first public hearing for this evening is the continued public hearing site plan review number 140-19, special permit 172-19, and inclusionary house, inclusionary, forget it, housing permit 17-19 for Depot 2, 166,000 square foot mixed commercial and residential building. 134, 142, 146 Rantoul Street. The applicant is Depot Square Phase 2 LLC. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, Miranda Gooding on behalf of the applicant, along with Chris Copeland, Thad Zemasco, uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Brown, our traffic consultant, and uh, Kristen Poulin. Um, thank you for your attention this evening. We're going to, uh, as you know, we uh, concluded the last meeting with a request for some additional information, particularly some um, additional views of the proposed project. And um, as a reminder, we had also stated at the end of the last meeting that we have, we have concluded sort of our, our affirmative uh, presentation of the case and the plans before you this evening and in your packet represent um, our final plans. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to Thad to walk through um, his plans and just um, uh, request an opportunity at the conclusion of any further public comment to address any questions or concerns or corrections that uh, might need to be made. Thank you. Uh, Thad Samasco, SV Design, Beverly. I'm um, just going to run through the, uh, mostly what the requests were for additional information. Just to remind you, this plan here is, shows the C-shaped building that faces the park on railroad with Rantoul Street on the bottom of the page, Park Street on the top, and on, running down the left is Pleasant Street. And in the middle of that C is, of course, a courtyard um, that we had talked about before which is shaped like this, which is divided between um, residential uh, use and use by the tenants of the space, as well as a, as a section for some public use. Size of this is roughly 60 feet by 85. This building from stage to that wall is, is 60, and then 85 is this length plus another, almost another, another length as well. So it's a good sized courtyard. Uh, we were asked by uh, DRB to be specific as to the materials we're using and where. Uh, so we uh, took this materials board and labeled materials A, B, C, D, E, and F, and G. And then on our elevations, which the DRB saw and approved, uh, we labeled them accordingly. The one change that happened as a result of the design review board meeting was this center section right in there, um, it, we proposed to change that from what was the lighter gray color to the darker gray color with the, with the material that had a little more texture to make it more interesting. I think that was a request by one of the DRB members and was viewed upon favorably uh, after some discussion with the board. Generally speaking, the, the notations just followed along what you had seen before. It's just make it 
makes it clearer and easier for uh, planning staff and others to, to ensure that what we show is what you, what you get. Can I just say it was yes. Good to know, we'll make sure that happens for all our projects, assuming there are more. Uh, it was asked that, uh, that we do the courtyard elevation. So these are the three walls of that courtyard. On the far left is the back wall of the CASA building with the connector. And then the brick part of the five-story section that's on Rantoul. Straight ahead, as I mentioned, is, that's the front residential entrance. That's the, that's the wall of the courtyard that faces the park. And then on the right is the, is the uh, left leg of the C, uh, and that, you can see that that uh, handling of the brick veneer along that whole length of uh, that leg goes all the way back to the face of the building. That's that 85-foot dimension I mentioned earlier. And up top, the fifth and sixth floor are, in fact, stepped back from that uh, four-story brick section. A uh, question regarding the, the color of the top floors. Uh, we like the color that was used at the Holmes building, which is that, uh, what I described as ethereal gray, which is that lighter gray here that does tend to go into the sky some. And then we added additional material on this larger scale drawing, detailed drawing of the CASA building to describe more clearly what we intended to do in terms of, of renovating the building. So what you see highlighted in yellow was, was additional notes, again, for clarification purposes. So we were asked to, um, if you were heading northbound on Rantoul Street, you know, what would you see? So here we are in front of the Gateway Building with Enterprise Building across the street, standing a little bit in the middle of the road. And in fact, the building that we're proposing to build cannot really be seen. This section here is Depot uh, Square, and then behind there somewhere would be our building. So when you're on that side of the street, our project is not seen. As you come a little further down the sidewalk, this is obviously this is now in front of the restaurant um, uh, homes. I'm sorry, Frank, right at the corner of Sarah's uh, building here. Uh, again, the building is gone. This this is a banner that's on the street, and you can just see, I think, the very top of the cornice of the building. So on that side of the street, we think basically the building is not visible. If you stand in the middle of the road or driving down the road, uh, what we've done here um, with a computer simulation is shown the building just past, this is Depot, uh, the Depot Square building, and our building sits in this section right here as it transitions down. Again, quite hard to see from this vantage point. If you cross the street and are in front of uh, the Holmes building looking back at it, you can see the building here as proposed that with, the, with the Casa de Luca building there, our five-story piece, our four-story piece in the fifth and sixth floors setting back. As mentioned before, this line of four stories kind of runs down in a continuous line. So what's happening is the, is the mass of the buildings are marching their way down to this lower point, hits the park, and then ties into those lower scale buildings on the other side of the park. A little bit closer in view, looking at what you would see if you were in the middle of the road, uh, looking um, in front of Depot Square here uh, at the project. Again, you can kind of see how the scale is working its way up. And we like, again, this varied roof line. And then I think you've seen this uh, before. This is across the street kind of at the corner of the post office looking back toward the building. Again with your, look, again, with your head looking sort of a little bit up in order to, to see the fifth and sixth floor up top there. And I think you've seen this drawing as well um, that shows if you're, and we confirm, this is standing on the sidewalk across the street, across um, Railroad Avenue, looking toward the courtyard. And then we, the, we use the computer to just draw these very simple diagram views looking into the courtyard where you see the backside of CASA. You can see the connector coming through the backside of the five-story building and then the residential entrance. And then another view in toward the courtyard to get a feel for what that, what that space might be like. 
again, no people, no trees, no color, but you get a feel for the, for the overall mass. And then um, if you're at the train station but heading down Park Street a little further, looking toward the building, this is the view that you would see. You'd see the cast, of course, on the left uh, with the 131 Rand Tool building behind it, the connector piece, the five-story piece, and then this, that uh, four-story leg with the fifth and sixth floor up here. And if you're at the crosswalk crossing from the depot, looking toward the project, this is what you would see. So predominantly, we think is, this, is, is the four-story brick coming down to the three-story casa and the taller parts of the building living behind where the depot square building is tall as, and the homes building is tall, and then the backdrop again is 131. So with that, I think um, we've got all the exhibits we're planning to show. Thank you. So we'll open up for public comment, please. If, if the first person on the list knows who they are, if not, we'll bring it up. Beg your pardon? Sorry, um, I wrote this down, but it's not long, so don't worry. Um, yeah, sure, it's Paul Boudreau, 8 Dartmouth Street. Uh, hello, board members and fellow citizens and Mayor Cahill. Um, I just wanted to say uh, I, I fully understand the need to expand our tax base to pay for city services, um, but I have a concern about the additional emphasis on increased development, um, and I think it, it threatens the very reason many of us transplants move to Beverly, um, I moved here about a decade ago, brought my family over here, um, left Salem because of congestion and not being able to get around town. So I believe that some downtown development is desirable. Having well thought out and integrated housing and retail strengthens downtown and brings vibrancy. I get that. Um, my concern is for the push on increasing density and having it th uh, threaten the city's character. Um, so I'm just asking that the board please keep this in mind when considering not only this, but future development in this city. Thank you. Uh, next is Peter Johnson. Thank you, Peter Johnson, 677 Hale Street. My wife Joan is passing out two things that I'd like to read into the record for you. The first is one that was presented to the Design Review Board on December 12, and it was um, illustrations of what we think should be preserved in the Casa de Luca facade, essentially, the externals, um, in trying to uh, preserve the, what the building sh looked like at its time of creation. So I'll just read it and we have a record going in here. We are grateful that the depot team has decided to save the Hotel Walter. Given this direction, the Depot Matters team would like to highlight key character-defining features that must be restored. We ask that you carefully reference the 1910 Hotel Walter photograph for details. These include the iconic angled corner door, transom, and surrounds. These elements should all be preserved or reconstructed in wood. This includes all the door detailing and paneling along Rantoul Street to the resident door to the south. Next, the iconic balustrade topping the Rantoul and railroad facades of the building should be reconstructed, replicating their proportions, dimensions, color, finish, height, as well as the baluster design and spacing. 
The cornice under the balustrade and the belt course over the first floor doors and windows should also be preserved or replicated in style and dimension. Again, height, thickness, and relief. The paint scheme for the hotel should enhance the unique features of the building with the cornice, belt course, balustrade, and paneling called out in contrasting colors similar to historic images. The number, size, and placement of the windows on the second and third floors should replicate the 1897-1910 appearance of the building. Windows can be two over one. All elements of the windows, casings, rails, styles, true divided lights are to match dimensions of the windows present in the 1897-1910 time period. The rhythm of the first floor windows should match that of the upper floors. Changing the window heights by lowering the sills of those windows on Railroad Avenue to visually engage more with the public would be welcome as long as the articulation of the historic character is maintained. Based on historic images, shutters may not be essential to the character of the historic building and could be omitted if shutters are added, as the developer has done, which is great. They should be of height and width appropriate for the window sizes they are, were, in theory, intended to cover. Like the windows, their components should be of thickness and width appropriate to the turn of the late 19th, early 20th century, and they should be mounted with appropriate hardware, not screwed to the walls. I'm pleased to th see that they have included pintles, which are the kind of hinges that you would have an operating window with. Recognizing that the developer would like to expedite approvals, and I know this is a thorny issue, what that means, in, as we presented, it was simply, you want to keep moving along. Nobody's suggesting they're trying to ramrod things through. It's just recognizing that there is a sequence of events here, and that not all details have been determined at this stage of the review. In this case, we suggested that the Design Review Board codify these design requests written into the board's motion for design approval. <coughs> they didn't do that. They simply said consult with the Historic District Commission. Any written and approved motion should include the stipulation that all final design by the developer include a submission of shop drawings, specifications, color, and material samples that highlight the treatment of the features and elements previously described. The Design Review Board can decide whether this approval should include the Historic Commission, Design Review Board, and or the Planning Board. My next um, summary really reflects that what the Design Review Board did was uh, say that they should consult, the developer should consult. Um, and I would want to say that <coughs> the Depot Matters Group generally um, still feel that the building is simply too big for the space. Um, we recognize there are a lot of people that feel that way. There are a lot of people that don't feel that way. We still feel it's too big, uh, that there shouldn't be special treatment um, with an exception for the, design, for the height on something that comes so close to the park. No matter which way you come down Rantoul Street, it's too big going toward the park and certainly coming from, um, let's say from bootstraps, heading toward Salem, you will see a lower building, but immediately behind it, you're gonna see five stories, six stories, and the depth perception isn't gonna mean much. It's simply gonna be a mass overlooking the park. That said, while many citizens appreciate and applaud Depot 2's decision to preserve the Casa de Luca building, Numerous concerns arise from the elevations presented in their des January 17 design package. These concerns include, among others, that the Depot 2 project manager met with a Depot Matters representative in November and assured us that it would have its civil engineering firm capture precise dimensional aspects of the building exterior, such as exposure of clapboards, reveal and thickness, dimensions and thickness of window and door trim and paneling, and historic design elements, such as door and paneling ornamentation, in order to faithfully reproduce those in the rehabilitation. This simply has not been reflected in the plans we see tonight. The resulting completely bland exposures of door paneling and header surfaces is the result of failing to pick up that detail. For example, 
Other things that we think the developer needs to pay attention to are inconsistencies, small but potentially significant, <coughs> in shutter design between those presented in the A113 detail, which is consistent with historic photos, and A118, where the meeting rail on the shutters is at a different height than the meeting rail on the windows. It sounds silly, <coughs> but if you look at a window and a shutter, there ought to be a straight line across shutter, window, shutter. In one of the illustrations, it's shutter, window, shutter. It just looks silly on the side of the building. I'm sure it's an oversight in getting things together. We just encourage that those details be looked at carefully. As I said, the Design Review Board has required that the developer consult with Beverly's Historic District Commission to establish specific design elements in the building facade, which help identify it as representative of early 1900s construction. This consult term is helpful, but inadequate to ensure that these consultations translate into actual incorporation into the final building. Depot 2 proposes that should the board vote tonight to approve the Depot 2 building plans, the following condition be included in and remain a part of the requirements of the approval. And that, that reads, and you have a copy of it that I'd like to follow. The developer shall consult with the Beverly Historic District Commission to develop an agreed architectural treatment that evokes the building's appearance during the period of significance for the Odell Park National Register District. These elements shall be incorporated into the Casa de Luca building rehabilitation to present the building in the style of that important stage of Beverly's history when railroads were critical to the city's development and define this area as an important 20th century urban center. Such elements will be incorporated in the building finishes at completion. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, may I ask you a question? Did you present this proposed language to the DRB? Um, I wasn't suggesting it was necessary. I was just asking if you had, that's all. Okay. Thank you. Um, there are no other names on this list. If there's anyone else who would like to speak, I'd ask them to come on up. Somebody behind, if we want to form a line, if there's additional people, that would be helpful. Thank you. Good evening, Wendy Pearl, 21 Morningside Drive. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, this has really been a long process reviewing this project. I'm sure um, you feel the same. It all began back uh, in that summer night in the packed City Hall chamber when a whole lot of people showed up to speak about this project. Not everybody got the chance. Um, and comments from the beginning really seemed to be about the scale and mass of this building, the loss of historic buildings, and issues related to the lack of on-site affordable housing. Please don't forget those comments as you deliberate tonight because that is part of this whole process. And at that time, a lot of people thought that the design really couldn't change. It couldn't get better. It was too late. The ship had sailed. I heard a lot of that. But with, with the persistence of the residents of, of the city of Beverly and through the thoughtful um, comments that have been provided at these meetings and through written comment, here we are with an improved design primarily and maybe solely through the preservation or the retention, I should say, of the Casa de Luca building. I think the, um, the new renderings that are so beautifully lit, everyone had this kind of wow reaction to them, and I think it's because the Casa building is being retained. But the original issues and those public concerns still remain. So if we as residents are to accept this compromise, please be sure the retention of the Park Hotel and the Hotel, or the hotel Walk, Walter, sorry, is as meaningful as possible. Please require that the treatment of the building retain or restore, or restore historic elements and make every effort to preserve the integrity of the National Register Historic District. We are still losing two National Register buildings, 
and as I've said before in remarks, that actually threatens the listing of the district, which means that any other property owners in that district would lose their eligibility for tax credits. So there are impacts from the loss of those two buildings beyond the visual and the sentimental. So this design has changed for the better. I think we can all admit that. But please be sure that the city gets the benefit of preservation if it has to swallow this rather large pill of a building. Thank you. My name is Dorothy Hayes, and I've brought along a picture. I'm sorry, 680 Hale Street. And um, I'm here to speak to the historic uh, building loss uh, that will be the result of this project, or losses. We have two buildings that we'll lose, one of which is the Hotel Trafton, which I think, frankly, of all three buildings is probably the most significant. It certainly had potential to be adaptively reused and restored so that it is a striking important building that it is for Beverly. Beverly has very little historic inventory in that area. And to have this loss, is, I think, is very disappointing, especially when historic credits were obtained on the representation to the Massachusetts Historic Commission that they would save these three buildings. And the credits were issued upon that representation. And now we're having these buildings torn down and those credits sold by the developer. I just think that's just disturbing. Um, so when you, you brought up at the last meeting, did the board speak to everyone's issues? I didn't feel that we heard enough about the historic building loss in this discussion. Um, as far as the hotel that's being saved, I think it's the right thing to do. It's the least that could be done. It, it ought to have been done. All three of them should have been saved. But that being said, um, it doesn't appear that that's going to happen. So I want to move on to my next issue, which is parking. Um, what I'm finding with these buildings is that they're using a parking spaces in the MBTA garage. And my understanding is that garage was built for commuter use. And what we're finding, or at least it's being reported, that by 8 in the morning, commuters can't find spaces. And so I'm not sure why the garage is being used to facilitate parking spaces that can't be met by the developers. And my last and third point is, the disproportionate number of one bedrooms in this building. It is almost hotel-like. I don't see where it's going to really encourage uh, any kind of long-term uh, use. That Those are usually transient uh, uses when there are only one bedrooms of that nature. So I think those are considerations I'd like to present. Thank you. Hi, Jerry Gillespie, 26 Vine Street, Beverly. Uh, although I, uh, you know, the building is beautiful looking, uh, it's a lot better than what's down there now, but like everyone was saying, I mean, this, is a, this is an historical district, and, and it's nice that we're going to salvage one building, but it would have been nice to keep all three. But beyond that, uh, I think we're going in two different, two different directions in the city. If you go uptown Cabot Street, when they did the design up there and put the bump outs in there, which I'm not in favor, but it looks better, and they took all the old trees down and opened up Cabot Street, it looks beautiful up on Cabot Street now. There's sun, there's bright sunshine up there. There's people that can m m maneuver around the city, and then you get down to Rantoul Street, and all you see is high rises. It looks like downtown Malden. I just think we're living in two different cities when you see Cabot and Rantoul Street. And if any, most of you live here in Beverly, if you don't know what it's like to try to park on Rantoul Street on a Friday and Saturday night, and then the MBTA and all of their great wisdom decide to drop the price of the garage fee or put it up to $4, amazingly, there's more parking spaces. Of course there is. You go down there in the last three or four weeks, every single morning by 9 o'clock, that garage is full. What's going to happen when that place is full? Where are people going to park in the city? You can't park there now. I think we have to take a real good look at this and scale it down and put it to, to a, 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 an area that, that will fit, the, fit this area and give us plenty of room to park and grow. It, it does look nice, but that's, I, I just don't like the way it's standing right now. Thank you. Thank you. 
Lynn Huber, 19 Lyman Street. Um, I assume that all of the comments that were sent by email um, and in any other um, written form are all being considered by you. Um, I just want to point out a couple of things that um, my family has been concerned about, one of which is the parking study, um, which I know my husband sent something about, have you really considered what that area is going to look like at 5 o'clock when people are coming to pick up their significant others with the train there? And my husband also pointed out that two nights a week, there are people going to bootstraps looking for parking um, that aren't going to be able to find parking in that area because people are even double parked in behind the cars that are for the, um, for the restaurant, those people who have uh, paid spots in order to pick somebody up. I'm also um, not sure from these pictures whether or not the lobby area, the open area on the corner of Park Street um, and the, right next to the park um, still got, is that still going to be a, a glassed in lobby area which was at one point, um, one point was discussed Yes, they're saying yes. Okay. Um, so I agree with the gentleman. I went down to Rantoul Street on a Friday and Saturday night recently, and it was one car after one car after one car all the way from about where the new buildings start all the way down to um, the Pickled Onion. There wasn't a single spot. So I'm not so concerned about the people who are living in those buildings. I'm concerned we're going to put a lot more um, commercial on that first floor, including, I've heard, at least two restaurants. Um, where are those people going to park for those commercial properties? Will those restaurants be able to thrive? Or if you're counting on the people in these buildings to go there, or people coming off the train to go there before they go home, is that going to be enough for these people to thrive? Or are you going to have people not coming? I mean, Beverly's become a little bit of a destination for restaurants. People come for the restaurants. But if they can't find parking, then it's going to be a problem. People aren't going to come. And those ventures are not going to be successful. People are not going to walk to them from other parts of the town. So those are things that I just wanted to bring up at this point. Thank you. Anyone else who'd care to speak? Pujo, 11 Longwood Avenue. I'd like to start off my presentation with giving you a copy of the National Register District that we will probably lose when these buildings go. I wonder if you've had a time to look at it. It's a very lengthy district. And the historic assets in that district are very unique to many. Many cities don't have the history that we have in Beverly, and we're just going to throw it away. The Mass Historic Commission said, with the loss of those two other buildings, that's it. The district will likely be delisted. So I don't understand why the talk is saving the Casa de Luca retains the historic integrity of the district. It really doesn't. And what we have here is a manufactured pres preservation crisis. Back in 2014, Windover Development's president, Lee Delacker, proposed saving the Casa de Luca and tearing down the other two buildings. And that's what caused all this mess in the first place with the tax credits. So we're now back to where we were in 2014, arguing whether saving one building saves a district. I believe it was Wayne Miller that wondered whether the planning board reflects the opinion of people and he said that he hopes to think so but i just keep hearing from people they come out of the woodwork saying how disappointed they are in what's become of beverly we need development and a lot of the development has done a lot of good but it seems like everything is all beverly crossings way or not at all and everything on their terms 
Now, I had some comments prepared all the way back in the summer that I never got a chance to read because the public hearing kept getting pushed and pushed, and a lot of people who wanted to speak have dropped off, but allow me to go through some of these. The proponents of the Depot 2 project keep referring to the tall building guidelines to justify this project. At the design review board, that was, that's all we heard, tall building guidelines, tall building guidelines. Well, we also have a master plan that came out, and Wayne, you again, you had asked, um, you know, we think the planning board is adhering to some of the things in the master plan, but there's a lot that's being ignored in the master plan. For instance, establish additional historic designations and districts to preserve historic features. Coordinate and expand site plan reviews of projects in these areas to protect and enhance historic features and conditions in the downtown. Maintain historic character. New development must come under well-defined guidelines to protect and enhance the architectural and historic character of Beverly's neighborhoods and significant properties. Recognize and enhance the city's historical and cultural assets as a means to retain unique identity, respect the past, and enrich the present. Support the efforts of an active citizenry that manages its destiny through a responsive city government, implementing its master plan and controlling the quality of growth. Now this is just a sample of some of the things we haven't done. It's all been about this vision for Beverly's downtown. Well, these things have fallen by the wayside. Now we're working on a new master plan. And what do people say they want to see? Adaptive reuse of historic buildings. Historic preservation, which other communities do a very good job with, and it doesn't slow revitalization down. That's what people want to see in the new master plan. Overdevelopment is also a huge concern that a lot of people have on their minds. When Matt St. Hilaire asked for a uh, survey of what do people think are some of the issues, overdevelopment was a huge issue. Paul Guancy and Tim Flaherty also talked about balance. We need to balance development and maybe think about some of the buildings that we're building because they're going to be here for a while. So this has been on the minds of many, many people, and I feel this board hasn't really represented that voice of the Beverly, Beverly citizenry. We've seen presentations where railroad history has been devalued. Railroad history is what turned Beverly into an industrial powerhouse. You wouldn't have the United Shoe without railroad history. And some of the comments about the, the lack of understanding about its impact really bothers me. Because we should be saving buildings that have to do with B Beverly's railroad history because that history is what transformed this city. Sure, the first settlers of Beverly didn't arrive by train, but it's the railroad that really changed the landscape of Beverly. It even ushered in the Gold Coast, because when the railroads came to Beverly Farms, that's when you saw a lot of those mansions being built. We've seen uh, Beverly Crossing take credit for saving 45 Broadway which happened under Lee Delacker's watch, and yet they distanced themselves from the decisions that led to this whole tax credit crisis. They say, that wasn't us. That was the people who came before. Yet they're taking credit for something that Lee Delacker had done. That was a building swap that was engineered by Mayor Scanlon, so you had political interference there. It was reported in the Boston Globe, I believe. And it's difficult because the people who write these master plans who contribute to surveys, whatever, we see all of our ideas just slip away with a lot of the politics that's going on in Beverly. And that leads me to believe why we're here now, at this point. <sighs> Manipulation of the National Register tax credits still happened under Steve Dodge's watch. We've talked about his legacy. Well, this is part of the legacy he leaves. 2,000 people, over 2,000 people signed a petition saying, hold on a minute, the scale of this project we're very concerned with, and the loss of historic properties we're concerned with, that's part of his legacy too. Will this be mentioned in any memorial built to this site? I'm guessing no. We've also asked Chris Copeland you know, what are the plans for this block throughout the years? 
In the Salem News, he said, from our perspective, it's premature to speculate on exactly what kind of development we envision for this block. We believe the con conversation and contemplation for any development on this block will begin in the next two or three years. But in meetings, they've wondered why we haven't come forward to ask them what's been going on. Maybe we can contribute ideas. You know, they say, what have you been doing in all this time these buildings have been sitting here? So they're putting the onus on us. However, we feel that there just hasn't been a climate of honesty where we could approach them. At the demolition delay hearing for the Casa de Luca, we were told by Miranda Gooding that in 2016, they had determined that it's just not feasible to save these buildings. And yet, about a year later, at the Ward 2 Civic Association, we asked, what are your plans for the buildings? Chris Copeland said, according to the meeting minutes, we don't have definitive plans to develop that today. We want to make sure, again, that it's a real urban core product to what we're doing. We want to make sure it's done carefully, that it's done right, and it's part of a historic district. Emma Basso said, everything is tending to be contemporary. So is there any, anything in mind uh, to keeping the historic value of these buildings? It's a most historic area. His response was, the buildings are in rough shape, but we're not ruling anything off the table yet. We haven't focused on them. We have a lot to do with the buildings we have in place right now. So here they're saying, we haven't really thought about these buildings. And yet, at the demolition delay hearing, they said, yes, we've thought about these buildings, we've analyzed the situation, and we're not saving them. So why is he telling the people of Beverly one thing, and he's telling the board another? We usually call that a lie in layman's terms. So I always have looked at this project as a broken commitment to the MHC and something that will be built on a lie. They made a commitment for those tax credits to retain these historic buildings, and now we're going to lose them. We should never forget that. That's part of the story of this block. During the, de during the demolition delay hearings and these planning board meetings, everything wrong with the Casa de Luca building was pointed out. They were saying it wasn't historic due to changes over time. And yet we've seen historic buildings that have very little historic fabric left still being declared historic because of the setting, the place that it takes up. There are many reasons why something is historic. And just to say it doesn't have a lot of the original material left invalidates the MHC opinion that said all three buildings retain their historic integrity despite changes over time. Beverly Crossing did not look into pursuing grants to help restore these buildings. So when they say we've looked at everything, there are some things they've left off the table. Talking to Andrew DeFranza, he said that early on when the press box was up for sale, they looked at possibly buying the building, but were told to stay away, that there were plans for that block. So you had a potential for these buildings to be saved. Also before that, in 2009, Caritas Communities was going to renovate the press box and work in partnership with a veterans group. Had city officials encouraged cooperation with the local veterans group and Caritas Communities, that building would be restored and be looking beautiful now. But again, you see political shenanigans going on. They have an agenda for development. And people's voices who are calling out for preservation were just never heard, were ignored. And now the latest thing is the housing crisis. There's a housing shortage, so we have to have projects like this. Well, we're losing a historic preservation district. These projects have been good for blighted areas like the Friendly site, although a lot of people will have issues with the design of the Friendly site. I think the Thomas Ford site, some of the exteriors on that building I find very challenging. I do like what they've done on the other side of the post office, but I keep hearing people talk about the canyon, talk about how things look very boxy. You definitely see a, a boxy look to this. I think for a historic district, it looks way too modern and too much like other buildings with the differences with the white material and the brick. It doesn't really look very unique. They're building a building in uh, Salem that's going to be a hotel that looks very similar materials. So, in conclusion, 
I've spent a lot of years advocating for the preservation of this block. My friend Richard Sims, who's a longtime historian, co-founder of the Walker Transportation Collection, which is a great place to see a lot of railroad history. We've been advocating for preserving this site, and every time we've just, our voices have been drowned out by a small group of people who just want it done their way, new development, preservation. Nope, we're not gonna do that. So I would like the board to think about this. Think about the impact. By voting yes on this project, you're voting for a lie. That they made a commitment, they stood up there and said to the Ward 2 Civic Association one thing, and then when they revealed, oh, we did something else. We made another determination in 2016. So just remember, a vote for the affirmative is voting for a building that's built on a lie. We should be preserving these special places in accordance with master plans. And lastly, I've never heard so much applause from people when people get up here to speak. And when the city was you know, investigating a tax increment financing, I was the only one to speak about historic preservation, and I got a lot of applause when everyone else that got up to speak about development didn't. That's the voice of Beverly that's being ignored, and I wish you people would not ignore us any longer. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to speak? Ms. Gooding, would you and your, or your team care to respond to any of the comments you've heard this evening? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think the first thing that I would like to respond to is uh, the uh, suggestion by uh, Mr. Johnson um, with respect to the additional condition for um, the board's consideration with respect to our uh, meeting with the historic uh, commission to review the project. And um, as, I, as I believe members will recall from the last meeting, um, and I know Ms. Flannery will recall from Design Review Board, uh, we've been consistent, and I intend that we will continue to be consistent, that we are uh, happy to meet and have a discussion with the Historic Commission uh, if this project is approved and granted a special permit. Um, we are happy to have that discussion about uh, what can be done more than what has already been done uh, with respect to the Casa de Luca design, uh, but that that is a voluntary discussion uh, without an obligation to undertake carte blanche uh, those recommendations. and, and I would say that uh, the list of items on the December 12th letter that Mr. Johnson provided, um, this letter has been considered at, at two meetings by the Design Review Board, and we have gone through those items in a fair amount of detail and um, have actually incorporated a fair number of them into the design already. I, I know that, you know, Thad would be happy to to talk to the board again and go through this if you want that, that level of detail. But the real point here is that we have been consistent that when the decision was made to incorporate the existing building into the design that it was done as, as keeping the building, but we are not holding it out as a historic restoration project. We are preserving the building, but it is not being restored to uh, to the uh, photos of, of Hotel Walter from the 1920s, which many of those conditions do not exist presently in, in what folks actually can see in, in that building right now, which has been um, largely the product of pretty substantial renovations from the 1970s. Um, so w I was actually intending to um, ask the board if and when the board 
uh, does uh, take a vote this evening to clarify one of the conditions in the Design Review Board's recommendation um, to the extent that the board elects to incorporate it with respect to meeting with the Historic Commission to, to clarify that th that recommendation, those recommendations are uh, non-binding on the applicant, that this is a voluntary process. Um, and uh, so that would be the first item to, um, to comment on. Um, bear with me while I go through this list a little bit. I, I think many of the speakers um, emphasized uh, issues that, that the board has heard and that we have discussed previously, so I, I'm not going to go through um, the arguments that we've made previously with respect to those. Um, the, the only other thing that jumped out that I think was, um, which I heard for the first time in this forum, is um, just wanted to correct something which is a statement made by Mr. Pujo, um, which was quite declarative that, uh, that this National Register District is going away when these buildings come down. And um, I will say that there is nothing uh, in the research that uh, our group has done to suggest that that is, in fact, a, a true statement. Um, and uh, I think that it uh, probably, uh, uh, just not, it's not a fair characterization, and I think the board should, should know that. Um, and, you know, as, as to the comments with respect to, um, I, I, I take issue with the uh, characterization of a vote in favor of this project as being based on a lie. Um, we have uh, been quite forthright in discussing the history of this project. And while uh, people may not agree with the decision that was made, um, this, this decision was made um, over a period of years and was a process. And um, there was not, there was uh, a change in circumstances, but there were not lies that were uh, made by this applicant or its predecessors or Mr. Dodge. Um, and I think that uh, it, it doesn't really help the discourse to introduce that into this board's discussion, nor is it something that um, ought to be part of the board's consideration in the special permit. The uh, zoning bylaw has criteria which are very specific, which we have gone through with respect to this project um, and the special permit requests that are in front of you. Um, and uh, it is... I think appropriate to remind the board that those are the criteria for, for making your decision and we believe that the project meets those criteria. And I would say that a, uh, a vote in favor of this project is a vote uh, in favor of preserving uh, Casa de Luca, something that happened as a result of this board's hard work. I would agree with the speakers. Um, I think uh, the comments from this board and other boards have led to a result, which I think all of us can, can feel good about. Um, and that a vote in favor of this project is a vote for, for saving Casa de Luca because there are alternatives that, that would not necessarily involve saving the building. Um, and this special permit relief is actually facilitating saving it. Um, so that, that would conclude our comments unless members of the board have specific questions. The board members have questions for Ms. Gooding or the team? Uh, Thad, quickly, uh, with respect to the lighting, you know this is an issue of, that I take great interest in in the dark, scar com dark, star compliant, dark sky compliant lighting. I see a lot of upcast lighting to highlight the facade of the building. I can't imagine that being dark sky compliant. Can you comment on that for me, please? That's exactly uh, 
I think I did see it on the Canvas building, and I was yes. thinking to myself, that doesn't look dark sky compliant. I thought we talked about that. So maybe you can address that, and it can uh, lay some of my concerns for Canvas, too. Uh, it doesn't comply with dark sky. These, those are not dark sky compliant fixtures on, this, on, ca on Canvas or this, this particular building. I can, I can only say that it's, it's a very low level of light fixture okay. that's being proposed. And it's decorative, fair Abs to say? Ab absolutely. So it's not a safety concern. I mean, you know that's an issue for me. So cer certainly I'd, I'd prefer to see a, a design that eliminates that. Um, I was surprised to see it on Canvas, given our prior discussions about dark sky. I think there's probably ways to highlight the building with downcast lighting. I think you've done that in the past, and I think that would be uh, a more appropriate, especially for a building of this scale uh, and this size. Um, so I, I guess, you know, without making that any more of an issue out of that, certainly I think my, my having brought it up in the past, um, should let you know how I feel about that. Um, so I'd like to know if there's a way you can incorporate some, some lighting to the exterior of the building that, that isn't upcast um, and would be more compliant with dark sky. I think I'd, you'd think I'd know how, uh, how to say it. Dark sky compliance. Yeah, I, I think this lighting is, is in fact decorative and not necessary for code or function. So uh, eliminating that could certainly, you know, could be done. Or, or down lights, but um, I mean, th there's sufficient lighting uh, at the ground level from the tenants. I mean, one problem right now with the canvas building is the tenants aren't there yet at the ground level, and so, it, so it's relatively dark. Once tenants are there, of course, it'll 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 be brighter at the at the pedestrian level. Um, this this is purely a decorative element that could be taken off the building. We are required at the balconies to have. Uh, light fixtures, and we tend to do the dark sky compliant down light at like an exterior balcony in, in a residential unit, for example. Um, <clears throat> Randy, you mentioned that you were going to discuss the uh, design review board's recommendation for a condition the applicant shall review the proposed development, particularly the Casa de Luca building with the Beverly Historic Commission in order to best determine how to preserve historic features. You, do you propose a rewording or a change in that condition? Uh, actually, all I would propose is that the uh, board acknowledge a simple sentence that uh, the board acknowledges that this is a uh, voluntary and non-binding meeting with the Historic Commission. Okay, so the the request from Depot Matters of their condition, the wording there w would not meet with your approval. That's at all. correct. Um, I might, you might want to consider that rewording their condition so that I, I see uh, two words changed and one eliminated. It would read, the developer shall cons consult with the Beverly Historic Commis District Commission to develop an architectural treatment crossing out agreed, architectural treatment that evokes the building's appearance during the period of significance for the Odell Park National Register District. These elements may be incorporated into the Casa de Luca building rehabilitation to present the building in the style of that important stage of Beverly's history when railroads were critical to the city's development and define this area as an important 20th century urban center. Such elements may be incorporated into the building, finishes at completion. Uh, Mr. Miller, I'm I'm fine with those suggestions. I would just I would suggest that um, the last sentence, such elements may be incorporated into the building's finishes at completion, in the applicant's discretion. Thank you. Ms. Gooding, if I could follow up with that. I do think the, his, the, 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 um, 
the historical aspect of this is important, and I do think the trains obviously played a major role in the development of, of the city. I'm less concerned about maintaining historical features to Casa de Luca, but instead finding some way to honor the historical aspect of that, of that district. One of the things that Cummings does incredibly well is they honor the history of that building through pictures, through exhibits, um, things like that. When you are talking about your willingness to meet with the Historical District Commission, but not be locked into anything, what do you anticipate that your, your team might be willing to do with respect to recognizing and honoring the historical district? Well, I, I think, yeah, I, I was going to suggest that that raises two separate issues. Um, and uh, the suggestion that we meet with Historic Commission, which came out of uh, conversations within the Design Review Board and, and among members and members of the public, uh, was not at all driven by a commemorative or other um, memori not, memorial is the wrong word, but a commemorative exhibit or artwork such as you see at, at Cummings. That, that was not part of the discussion. So um, I, w we were not uh, under the, the impression that that would be a topic of, of discussion with the Historic Commission. That said, um, I, I believe Chris is, is more than happy to dedicate space that would be used for commemorative space for the railroad history and for the history of these buildings. And um, I know that there was some talk about uh, areas where that could be done. So we can talk with the board about this. We can talk with the historic commission about it. Um, that or Chris, one of you want to talk about what you, the thoughts were? Miranda, can I just jump in for a second? Mm -hmm. And I do apologize because I think my, my question was, was poorly worded. I guess what I'm trying to get at is, to be absolutely frank with you, I'm less concerned about the historical features of the Casa de Luca building and more concerned about working with the Historical District Commission to do something to memorialize or to recognize or to honor the history of Beverly and that district as, as a train center, as, as, as the role it played in developing. Uh, and I'll, I'll let Chris speak. I just, I would, um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting discussion as to whether the, whether it would be the Historic District Commission, which is primarily concerned with architectural restoration, or the Beverly Historic Society, or Historic Beverly, I believe they're called now. Um, and, and that, we've certainly been engaged in conversations with them, and I'll let Chris let you know. That's all I was gonna say. We've already had conversations with uh, the director, Goganian, on how to honor the history of the block in this courtyard, uh, in various opportunities around the building. Those conversations have begun, and she's offered her help, and we're gonna definitely do that, uh, certainly, yeah. Chris, just to follow up, is, are you planning a dedicated space that will be a permanent installation on the site such that if that were made a condition of approval, that's something you're yeah. already working on? Yeah, in the courtyard, uh, right? That's why we have planting beds that are raised. Um, we had a place for a sculpture inside there. So it's right near the benches. Yeah. Right over there, there's a big wall on the backside of CASA. And, and the right edges of those planting beds as well. We wanted to have an engagement feature uh, somewhere. We don't know exactly where, like, where but that light is in the middle probably. Uh, kind of like what Cummings does in that sort of regard. Uh, that's what we're hoping to do. So um, I'm not a Buddhist. I, I just want to reference that, right? So ahead of time. But in Buddhism, as I understand it, this is concept called emptiness. And that um, is uh, trying to master the capability when you're hearing someone talk to you of not 
interpreting something from a position where you're afraid they're going to be coming from or negativity that uh, maybe you have or something like that. So that I'll preference it. I preface uh, my question. So, so now I'm trying to practice the concept of emptiness because what I hear you saying when you offer the voluntary, no commitment, non-binding, all of these words coming at me is, we'll be happy, this is the way it sounds to me, okay? So I want to ask if this is, has any accuracy. We'll be happy to meet with them, but we don't want to be held to any ideas, uh, proposals, recommendations, or whatever they have for the work unless we agree with them. That's what I hear. So help me get off that horse. Help calm me down and show me, if it's possible, that actually you will work in a cooperative way with some agreement and give and take and compromise to come up with something the historic district team would be happy with, if that's possible. And try, now, obviously I lost my emptiness there at the end, because you could, right, right? <laughs> So now I ask you to practice emptiness when you're answering me, okay? And, and I apologize if I was passionate. I try to be dispassionate. I just think it makes the most sense, and we owe it to the project. We owe it to the citizens. We owe it to the Casa de Luca building. We owe it to the history of the area to do whatever it is we can do with what's left to pay tribute. And, you know, with all due deference, um, beyond a commemorative and things like that. Let's, let's see what we can do with this. So the, the lawyer here is going to uh, explain a little bit um, and take some of the blame for um, what you heard, Mr. Beckwith, which um, I, I will tell you is born out of the fact that um, part of my job is to figure out what boards have jurisdiction to do what. And um, when we were meeting with the DRB um, after you know, a substantial amount of work to incorporate Casa de Luca into the project, um, our concern, my concern, jurisdictionally, if you will, which is not Buddhist at all, but it's a lawyer thing, um, is that we could have these discussions with the Historic District Commission but I want to be clear that that commission, which ordinarily might have jurisdiction over a, a, a true preservation restoration project, or a building which actually is within the district, or it might have jurisdiction over the renovation of this building if there were the triggers that, that put us in front of the historic commission, I don't want any confusion about that um, as a lawyer because that's not where we are. This building does not trigger any jurisdiction of the Historic District Commission, whether we decide to take it down or whether it's preserved. So I want to be clear before we go down that slippery slope that this applicant and the design team have worked in, in really good faith and made a very honest effort to be true to the spirit of keeping this building without, without rebuilding something that's, that's not there. Um, because that, that and, and Thad can speak to this more articulately. And I, I will say that he's going to, I'd like him to walk through the things that are outlined in that letter that have actually already been done. So the suggestion by some members of the public and, and by reading a letter that is, is now six weeks old and doesn't take into account some of the discussion that has gone on in these meetings, the team has actually incorporated a fair number of these. But for reasons that Thad will elaborate on, we don't agree that all of them make sense. I'm going to be very full rather than empty, um, if that's OK. So first of all, it, I, as I understand it, this drawing that we provided to the board is binding. The DRB SART approved it. 
this is in your package, what's shown here will be done. So, so it's not as if we're trying to walk away from something. Uh, we have available to us a single black and white photo from 19 something of, of this building. I have yet to figure out how to look at a black and white photo and figure out how, what color the building might have been. Um, because the only thing left on this building that is original, in terms of the finishes that you see on the outside, as I mentioned before, is this cornice line right here. And there's vestiges of a band course here, but it's the back of the band course, it's, it's the metal, and it was never just this metal, sheet metal. According to the photo, it was built out like a cornice. So what we have done, in very fine detail at a half inch scale as a foot, which is not normal. The rest of the drawings are at eighth inch scale, so four times bigger than normal. We've drawn this building out. We've analyzed with the photograph and with a scale as best we could, how tall is this balustrade? We don't have drawings. If we had drawings, we'd say we'd, we'd replicate it. So from the top, this balustrade had the spacing of these newel posts is very far apart. That's what we show in the drawings. The height was very low compared to what you'd expect today. That's what we show in the drawings. The spacing of the balusters is a little bit wide. That's what we show in the drawings. We use a material that we've specified that won't rot in five or 10 years, that will be there for a long, long time. It's expensive material. It's more expensive than the wood that would rot, but we, we want that to stay up there. Then we get to the cornice, which we're maintaining. All of the clapboards on the building now are from the 1970s, early 80s. They have a mill glaze. That's why the paint won't stick. They're not the original scarf clap. They're not, cl they're not original. We're taking it all off completely. All of the windows are Anderson or some actually worse brand than that from the 70s. They're not original w windows. The window openings up here, we're maintaining exactly where they are. We're not changing or enlarging a single window. The casings around the window are a band molded casing, which we've called out in painful detail right here. Shutters are real. It's sort of insulting to think we just screw shutters on a building. They're real, they look like they operate, they're made to fit. I'm sorry that my freehand drawing that I did quick didn't have these things lined up. Of course they would line up. Clapboards would have the exposure that we would expect that they would have had that, which is roughly four inches to the weather. We will rebuild this, this cornice uh, uh, molding, but trim belt, as close to what we can see in the photograph is what is there now. What we did differently here was this is now a retailer. It's not a hotel with individual little rooms or whatever was there. So we opened this up more that you saw in the renderings. We think that's the right answer. All of the panel work that you see there that runs down Railroad Avenue is plywood paneling with some kind of uh, 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 band molding. That's really an interior man molding, not meant to be on the exterior. It's all, if you look at it closely, the plywood's delaminating, all that trim is starting to rot. All the pine was, was not back prime, then it's pine from the 70s. It's rotted. We're putting back what we think is the right look for this building, and we're trying to balance that look with the rest of the project so it feels like it flows. We like the tone-on-tone -tone color. We, did, we didn't think highlighting it was appropriate with the rest of the building. So all this stuff is built into the plans. The doors there now are aluminum from the 1970s. There's some kind of foam thing that stuck, was stuck on the building at the other doorway. We're taking that off because that wasn't original. And we're putting it back what we think is a really good looking building that for, for all the world looks like what was there before actually better than what was originally designed. That's all committed to in these drawings. What I think Miranda was suggesting is to go to a historic commission and have them make a condition that we can't necessarily fulfill because we don't have original drawings might, might not have been the best idea. Thank you. Thad, thank you very much. Um, and, you know, it... it uh, it's clear that, it, well, it sounds like you, you've done like 80% of the different things that were here. And so, you know, then I don't see, um, I don't see a problem with understanding the, the deep community interest in this. I don't see a, a problem with trying to come up with a way 
that um, th that helps the community, um, the people who are concerned about the building, and understanding that this isn't you know the full according to his every historic standard, et cetera, et cetera, um, but it's a discussion and an uh, ultimate um, agreement on yeah this will work if you're already 80 percent there. I don't understand what the problem is to find some sort of mechanism to be able to have that happen so that for those people who are concerned that um, the, the board just sort of says okay to developers or whatever, that there's some mechanism for continued um, community concern and support um, for the project. And I think it would turn into a good thing, not a negative thing for you. That's just my, my perspective. We appreciate your comments. Um, we're doing our best to save this building and 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 give it the uh, proper respect that it deserves. Um, I, I'm not going to add too much, but I appreciate your comments. We want to work collaboratively with everyone, the neighborhood, Ward 2. That's why we're in Ward 2, uh, our business, and that's why we want to be here and, and see this uh, done right. So. Uh, Miranda, I somewhat reluctantly asked this, but can you reassure the board and citizens that uh, the applicant and the city administration, administration are not, as has been suggested this evening, engaged in political shenanigans? Um, well, actually, thank you for the question, because sometimes as an applicant, uh, before the board, there are um, quite a number of comments that it doesn't make sense to respond to all of them. Um, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, this, this, I, I can't imagine how this process could be more transparent. Um, this is the eighth public hearing. There were, I don't know, six DRB meetings. Uh, public hearings before the Historic District Commission for Demolition Delay. Um, this is a very public process, and uh, the shenanigans, if, if, if investing in the city, uh, becoming a taxpayer that, when this project is done, will contribute $1.5 million to the bottom line for all of us in this city, um, is shenanigans if giving back to multiple organizations uh, in the city is shenanigans if uh, whether these uh, hi historic preservation uh, projects that have been done by the applicant and uh, related entities is shenanigans um, then we're guilty of shenanigans <laughs> Um, I, I would say that, honestly, it's been uh, a, a very open and transparent partnership with the city. Do, do all of us wish that the uh, discussion regarding the historic tax credits is one that we weren't having or didn't have to have? Absolutely. Um, that, that, that is what drove the decision, ultimately, that and standing up and hearing the passion that members of the community brought to this forum, uh, that is what drove the discussion, the decision, a, a very, um, uh, a very financially significant decision to incorporate Casa de Luca into this building after we did stand up and say in many forums that it couldn't be done because it, it couldn't be done in a way that was financially viable from a development standard. What happened here is that a, the decision was made, as, as Chris uh, explained when we first came back to you, um, because of the relationship with this company and its founders to the city, the decision was made that saving Casa de Luca, even if it 
made this project completely financially unviable without a substantial subsidy from uh, the family, uh, it was the right thing to do. So uh, I, I, I think there are great things, and this, this has been a great story, the Windover, the Beverly Crossing story for the city of Beverly. I, I don't think it's shenanigans. Thank you. Madam Chair, would this be a uh, time to call on the mayor for comments? If the mayor would like to speak, certainly welcome to do so. Your Honor, would you like to speak? Good evening, everybody. Um, sure, I've got some thoughts. I, 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 uh, a few thoughts I want to share, and I guess probably first I want to thank everybody uh, involved. As, as um, Ms. Gooding just kind of walked us through, this has been a, uh, a really robust process. I think this is the most exhaustive planning board process we've had since the um, Whole Foods Plaza, right, which took several years, actually. Um, but this has been a, a really great process. I believe that the project as it's proposed, as it's now in front of you, has been made better and better and better yet again because of the involvement of everybody who's sitting in this room and because of the involvement of, of people who maybe aren't here tonight but have been invested in the, in the process. Um, so, yes, I do have some thoughts. I've been carrying them around for months, um, and now, why don't I share them now? Uh, probably best to use my glasses. Um, so I, I will say that um, the many meetings here, the many meetings before DRB, uh, it's been a very passionate process, and generally, not always, but generally respectful. Um, and I think that we can, we can feel good about that, and we can always do better. And I just say that the, the public discourse, it, it is important that it be uh, respectful at all times. Um, a lot of uh, issues and questions raised, a lot of thoughtful, thorough process. Um, and in terms of, of, you know, being open and being accountable, um, you know, I said from the first day I took office that anybody who wants to invest in our community um, with their money, with their, uh, with their thoughts and their passions and their dreams, whether it's somebody opening their first business as a tenant, somebody investing in, in large tracts of, of property in our community, Anybody who wants to invest in this community, we want to hear from them. And, and that doesn't mean that every idea that comes forward is something that ends up being built, right? But it is important um, to always be open to the conversation. Um, and I, I will say that we've worked very closely with the team from Beverly Crossing uh, to understand the project, to see it improve along the way. And, and, and uh, Chris Copeland knows you know, Mr. Clausen and I have sat with, with Chris and with the late Mr. Dodge uh, many times over this property over the years, and there were times that we were pushing hard on, on preservation, and, and I'm really grateful and appreciative of how we got to the, the Casa de Luca being incorporated into the project. I think that's important. Um, so just to, you know, again, thanks to everybody who's had any part in moving the conversation to where we are tonight. Um, Three points beyond that. I do want to speak about Mr. Dodge for a couple of minutes uh, because we have many great partners in this city. Um, Steve Dodge, the late Steve Dodge, is, is, is one of the best. He was a good man. He cared about this city. He has built much needed high quality housing in a transit oriented model. The transit oriented model is, is what our community, through a, a very a uh, very robust master planning process back at the beginning of this century uh, put in place. And that mas master plan uh, set a real high value to recognizing that the best way to meet our housing needs was to put housing in denser settings closer to our trains. Because as we all do understand, it's not that a, a, a unit of transit-oriented housing brings no cars, but the units of housing near, within walking distance of the train, bring fewer vehicles. Consistently, through the, the several projects that have been built over the last decade plus, fewer than one car per housing unit. And those vehicles take fewer car trips along the way. 
Uh, there's more of what they need to do that they can do by walking. Not that they'll never get in their car, obviously, uh, but many of the residents who moved into the, the newer transit-oriented developments are taking the train, whether it be for work or for other uses. They are walking to some, not all, but some of their, their, uh, their daily um, errands and, and destinations. So it, it's a model that works. It works all around the world. It's a sustainable uh, city, downtown city design. And so it's, it, it has real value. Um, what we've seen in the housing built around our Beverly Depot is somewhere in the order of one Beverly Public School student for every 35 to 40 housing units. As I said, fewer than one car per unit. Um, so back to, to Steve Dodge. He, he believed in our downtown when many didn't. He believed in the Rantoul Street corridor. He invested in our downtown when others wouldn't. And I think that that matters. Um, he has always listened. He's always worked to try to, to, try to uh, collaborate with neighbors, with the community. Um, and we really miss him on a lot of fronts. Um, he, and, and this isn't really germane to this project, but it bears saying because it's part of who he was. He as an individual, he and his wife, donated millions of dollars to help stabilize, strengthen, and, and set Montserrat College of Art on a course to be viable in our, in, in our community going forward. He similarly, they similarly, invested in the Cabot Theater to help ensure its, its preservation. And then Steve Dodge dove right in and became, was the chairman of the board at, at, at the Cabot, and was hands-on with all the efforts to really uh, restore the Cabot and, and, and bring the programming in to make it, um, such a contributing component in our downtown. And it's really been a linchpin to our downtown's revitalization. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. He, he was a good man. He was a, a, a tremendous partner to all of us in this, in this community. Whether we all agreed with any given uh, project and the aesthetics or design of any given project, there's been a lot of good that has come out of um, his interest in, and commitment to this community. And, and, and I just, I say that and um, you know, rest his soul, he was a good man. Um, the second real key point is the affordable housing conversation. I know that it's, it's kind of all been said and heard. It just bears repeating that in the several projects that Beverly Crossing has built to date, they have built the affordable housing that our inclusionary housing zoning, uh, housing ordinance requires on site in their buildings. On this one project, they have asked that the units not be in the buildings. And the reason is this. Several years ago, we as a community, we looked at the fact that our inclusionary housing ordinance wasn't really getting us the affordable housing we needed. It wasn't getting the deep affordable, the under 60% of area median income, the under 30%, the really stressed individuals and families who just flat out couldn't afford to be in our community. It wasn't getting those units, so we rewrote the ordinance to try to facilitate and incentivize that. And Beverly Crossing, in two instances, they looked at what we were asking, and they, they came on board. OK, so the Hardy Street, 6 Hardy Street, is that the right address, 6 Hardy? 2 Hardy Street, that's a property they owned. They, they deeded it over to Harbor Light Community Partners, and, and now those units are under construction. Six units, you know, they're, they're right behind the, the Flats building, so they're just about a block further away from the train than this proposed development. And then they rehabbed a building with another six units further down Rantoul, just past the Jiffy Lube on the corner of... It, it, it's pretty much across the street from the, from the old Friendly's redevelopment. So those are 12 units of housing that are deeply affordable. And, and that's something we've desperately needed in this community. So what they did was, consistent with the zoning, they came to you some of you and, and some of you, your predecessors, and they asked for approval to bank those units for a future project. Now here's the future project. So this is the first time, and it maybe will be the last time, we'll, we'll have further conversation about how to handle this, that we're seeing a, a project proponent ask that units that are not actually in the building be counted. And I support that because again, that has led to those units which are so desperately needed, and they're right in our downtown, in that transit-oriented, mode and that opportunity for a much lower income level of, of people in our community. So that's the affordable housing piece. And then I'll, I'll just 
the, the last piece I'll, I'll reference is, um, and I, I mentioned it a bit earlier, uh, this is, this block, it's an important block, it's an important project in so many ways. You could not be closer to the train platform than the front door of this proposed project, right? This is transit-oriented more than any other project we've seen. If not, if we aren't going to put dense housing here, if we aren't going to try to get more people housed here, when you literally, if you've got a strong arm, could throw a, throw a baseball and hit the train on its way by, it's there. That's transit-oriented. You know, so um, the many, many improvements in design and aesthetics, the scaling back consistently and again and again of the, of the footprint, um, the consistency along Rantoul Street with the, at, with the request for the additional height, they're still no higher than the Sarah Barnett building, the newer building at, um, help me out where I used to live, Gateway, at the Gateway. This is not any taller than those buildings. In fact, I think it's shorter than one of them. But it's downhill from them, right, as you think of it coming down Rantoul. So, you know, there's a lot here. Uh, I, I know, uh, however this vote comes out tonight, some will be happy, not everybody will. Um, Everybody's had a hand in this. If it does get approved, everybody can, can take something from it. Um, I think in terms of our need for housing, look, our housing need continues as we've been discussing the new master plan, which we're still in the process of putting together final recommendations. There's no doubt that we continue to not have enough housing for all demographics, age levels and income levels. And one of our challenges as a community is how to meet those needs while still being a viable, sustainable, walkable community. I think this does meet a lot of those needs in that sense. And I, I'm grateful for, for everybody's work here. And I, for one, am, am in support of the project. I appreciate um, your time tonight. And I appreciate your time all these many months on this and, and other important projects. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Anyone else? Um, I just wanted to note that the, the, I, I believe that the historical railroad contribution to our city was profound and is recognized, and it was, in fact, transit-oriented development. This project now before us is, as the mayor has just made clear, I believe is the modern evolution of that same transit-oriented development. Um, as Mary Grant pointed out in her letter, the world is homeostatic. The more things change, the more they stay the same. We have... We started with transit-oriented development. It built the city, and we're, that's where we are with this project, I believe. OK. That being said, I'd welcome a motion to, dare I say, finally close this public hearing. I'm sorry. There's a motion before the board. Mr. Vesh has seconded the motion. Discussion on the motion. All in favor? All opposed? Motion passes. Public hearing is closed. Can I get a motion to take a five minute break? Can I get a second on that? Seconded by Mr. Beckwith. All in favor? All opposed? We're in recess for five minutes. Besh, all in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, our next agenda item is our discussion and decision on public hearing uh, number two that we just discussed, the Depot 2, 134, 142, 146 Rantoul Street. What is the will of the board? Well, if, if I could, I, first of all, Zane, Zane Craft will not be participating in our vote tonight because of the rules and regulations. He's uh, missed two meetings of the public hearings and therefore is ineligible to, um, to participate in the, hear in the vote.
So, um, Madam Chair, I think your question was what was the will of the board. I, I would suggest respectfully to the board that we um, start talking about a motion. I think we heard from the planning department that motions, and we learned this last month, that motions made are, are made to be made in the affirmative, and then um, if not sufficient votes are uh, cast in a favor, then the motion doesn't carry. Um, I think that our discussion can probably take place in the context of a motion, um, but certainly if we want to have some discussion beforehand, but I think we probably should act on this tonight, um, um, s however the board wants to go forward with that in yeah, terms of discussion. Just for the audience's um, edification, there are three matters that have to be uh, voted on. Uh, one is the inclusionary housing permit. Uh, the second is the special permit with, I'm calling it two parts. The first part is, uh, is the under the city's uh, CC height overlay district buildings up to 75 feet in height are allowed by special permit. The second part of that special permit is from deviation from the parking requirements where a portion of the lot is not in the depot parking lot I'm sorry, the depot parking overlay district. Uh, the inclusionary housing permit is to allow the applicant, if the project is voted upon, to apply credit unions, units uh, that are located at 2 Hardy Street to count towards the affordability requirement for this project. And 461 I'm sorry, I've been corrected, thank you. And 461 Rantoul Street as well. And then finally, site plan review, because this is new construction. I want to thank the applicant for what has been a grueling process. I want to thank the public for their, their input, their concern. This project, however, what, however this comes out, this project has been very well vetted. There has been, I think, very good communications. And I think the city, as I've said before, I think the city is better when our citizens interact with our boards and interact with the applicants who seek the development of these projects. Get moving on the motion? Yeah. Okay. I apologize in advance for the drone of my voice. Uh, this is a lot to cover here. Um, So to begin, I'd like to make reference to the eight public hearings, the more than 78 comment letters we received, the more than 50 members of the public who have spoken, the numerous experts, boards, and committees to have reviewed and commented on this project. Um, on the basis of the evidence presented uh, to this board, I move that the board adopt the following findings with respect to special permit 172-19. Get the number right. Yep. Finding one, that the specific site is an appropriate location for the proposed use and that the character of adjoining uses will not adversely, will not be adversely affected. We find support for this finding in the proximity to the train and the mixed commercial and residential nature of the neighborhood. Uh, in fact, the character of the adjoining uses will be enhanced as a result of this project. Uh, finding two, no factual evidence is found that property values in the district will be adversely affected by such use. This board has heard no evidence uh, to the contrary. Finding three, that no undue traffic and no nuisance or unreasonable hazard will result. This finding is supported by the report of GPI as presented by Rebecca Brown and her team and by the review conducted by the Parking and Traffic Commission. Finding four, that adequate and appropriate facilities will be provided for the proper operation and maintenance of the proposed use. This finding is supported by the review of the city engineer, as well as the other boards and committees to have reviewed this project. Further, we have heard no credible or demonstrable evidence to the contrary. 
Additional evidence has been submitted by the applicant in support of this finding, including but not limited to stormwater uh, management report, traffic impact and access study, transportational analysis, and others. Finding five, that there are no valid objections from abutting property owners based on demonstrable facts. While we've heard numerous valid opinions from members of the community, uh, these do not rise to the level of objections based on demonstrable, demonstrable fact sufficient to deny the special permit. Finding six, that adequate and appropriate city services are or will be available for the proposed use. Again, we find support for this finding through the review conducted by the city engineer as well as the other boards and committees to have reviewed this project. Further, there has been no uh, credible or demonstrable evidence to the contrary and additional evidence has been submitted by the applicant in support of this finding, including but not limited to its storm, stormwater mem memorandum, traffic impact and analysis, uh, traffic impact and access study, transportational analysis, and others. Accordingly, and based on the foregoing findings, I respectfully move that this board approve special permit 172-19 to allow a building height of up to 72 and a half feet in height in the CC height overlay district pursuant to section 300-40.D5 in that the planning board finds that the proposed, proposed project has met the general intent of the city's design guidelines for tall buildings and the objectives embodied therein, therein, and as recommended by the City's Design Review Board in a letter dated 1-12-2019, and to approve Special Permit 172-19 for deviation from the parking requirements pursuant to Section 300-59, where a portion of the lot is not in the depot parking overlay district, and to apply the parking requirements for the depot parking overlay district to the entire project site resulting in parking requirement of one on-site parking space for each residential unit in the project that is two bedrooms or less. This motion and the approval of the special permit 172-19 is subject to the following conditions. First, the conditions as outlined by the Parking and Traffic Commission in a letter dated 10-9-2019 to inc be incorporated herein by reference. Next, the conditions as noted in the Beverly Fire Department letter dated 9-10-2019 uh, and incorporated herein by reference. Next, the conditions as set forth in the Beverly Engineering Department letter dated 7-16-19 and incorporated herein by reference. The conditions noted in the Design Review Board letter dated 1-12-2020 specifically that dark gray panels shall be utilized on the north courtyard facade rather than blue or light gray panels and that prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall return to the Design Review Board to review the locations of the vents on the building. Additional conditions that the developer will consult with the Beverly Historic Commission to develop an architectural treatment that evokes the building's appearance during the period of significance for the Odell Park National Register District. These elements may be incorporated into the Casa de Luca building rehabilitation to present the building in the style of that <clears throat> important stage of Beverly's history when railroads were critical to the city's development and define this area as an important 20th century 
urban center. Such elements may be incorporated into the building finishes at completion at the applicant's discretion. Next condition shall be the incorporation of a dedicated space used to recognize the historic nature of the area and buildings. Next condition, that lighting shall be downcast, dark sky compliant lighting, minimizing decorative lighting not necessary for safety or compliance. Additional conditions as follows. Work shall conform to the approved project plans as amended where appropriate. Architectural plan set Depot 2 building, 134-142-146 Rantoul Street and 1-9 Park Street, Beverly, Massachusetts, 01915. 20 sheets, scale varies, prepared by Depot Square Phase 2 LLC, 15 Rantoul Street, Beverly, Mass, 01915. Prepared by SV Design, 126 Dodge Street, Beverly, Mass, dated 6 10 19 and amended through 1 17 2020 civil plan set permit site development plans 134 142 146 rand tool street and one through nine park street beverly 01915 eight sheets scale varies prepared for depot square phase 2 llc 15 rand tool street beverly 01915 prepared by meridian associates 500 cummings center Suite 5950, Beverly 01915, dated 61019. To be updated to reflect changes. <laughs> any changes made in any plans, proposals, and supporting documents approved and endorsed by the Planning Board without the written approval of the Planning Board shall require submission of a modification request to the Planning Board for review and approval and shall include a description of the proposed modification, reasons the modification is necessary, and supporting documentation. The Planning Department shall determine the course of review. Next condition. Prior to the commencement of authorized site activity, the applicant shall provide to the Planning Board office the name, address, email, and business phone number of the individual who shall be responsible for all construction activities on site. Next, the applicant shall provide two full size and two 11 inch by 17 inch copies on a PDF version of the complete set of the final approved plans with the latest revision dates within 14 days of this decision, including the civil plan set entitled Permit Site Development Plans 134, 142, 146 Rantoul Street and 1 through 9 Park Street, Beverly, Mass, 01915. Eight sheets prepared by Meridian Associates, 500 Cummings Center, Suite 5950, Beverly, 01915, dated 61019, and shall be updated to reflect the changes in the architectural plan set and included therein. Next condition. The terms, conditions, restrictions, and or requirements of this decision shall be binding on the owner and its successors and or assigns. In the event of the transfer of the site as a whole, within five days of such transfer, the owner shall notify the board in writing of the new owner's name and address. Next, maintenance of all landscaping on the site shall be the responsibility of the applicant, its successors or assigns, and any tree or shrub that does not survive shall be replaced. Next, an as-built landscaping plan accompanied with a letter from a registered professional engineer or landscape architect certifying compliance of the landscaping with the approved plan shall be submitted to the planning department prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy. Next, refuse removal ground maintenance and snow removal shall be the responsibility of the applicant. Winter snow in excess of snow storage areas on the, sh on the site shall be removed off-site. Next, the owner shall comply with the following, no, 
as, next, as, strike that please. As built plans stamped by a registered professional engineer shall be submitted to the planning, to the Beverly Planning Department and city engineer prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy. The as built plans shall be submitted to the city engineer in an electronic file format suitable for the city's use and approved by the city engineer prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy. Next, to the extent that construction work has been completed sufficient for a certificate of occupancy to be issued for a portion of the project or the project in its entirety by that, but that the as-built plans have not yet been fully completed, parens, for said portion of the project or the project in its entirety, close parentheses, the applicant may provide a performance bond or sh surety in an amount and form subject to approval of the planning department to ensure that the as-built plans are completed within a reasonable time frame. Next, the applicant shall be responsible for maintenance of the stormwater management system. In the event the applicant, its successors or agent, fails to maintain the stormwater management system in accordance with the operation and maintenance plan, stormwater system inspection and maintenance schedule, as shown on the above referenced plan, the city may conduct such emergency maintenance or repairs and the applicant shall permit entry onto the property to implement the measures set forth in such guidelines. In the event the city conduct, conducts such maintenance or repairs, the applicant shall promptly reimburse the city for all reasonable expenses associated therewith. If the, fi if the applicant fails to so reimburse the city, the city may place a lien on the property to secure such payment. Next. Violations of any condition shall res result in revocation of this permit by the planning board unless the violation of such condition is waived by a majority vote of the planning board. Yes, do we have it? Yep, I just didn't know what the date of it was. The owner shall, <clears throat> next condition, the owner shall comply with the conditions set forth and issued by the Beverly Board of Health in its letter dated 7519, uh, ref incorporated herein by reference. There's a motion before the board, seconded by Mr. Besh. Discussion on the motion, please. So uh, I might as well go first, I guess. Um, I won't take a lot of time. I think by the questions that I've asked through the process and the information I gathered and presented on um, uh, the cost of housing and affordability, things like that, um, people can probably guess where I am. Um, on the project, but I just have uh, three different categories that I examined as I made my decision. Um, the first is the mass and scale of the project. And this project, it, this is in a historic area, this project is at least four times as large as anything that has historically been on that block. Four times. So this is huge. It, it's 106 apartments, it's retail space, it's six floors, it changes by nature of its scale, it changes this gateway to our city in a way that we will never be able to recapture, ever. I, I, I've gone down there at night during the day, today I went down there thinking about today, I stood on the corner, I stood at, at the corner of, of of park and railroad and I just looked up in the air and, and I walked over to the, the depot and I looked at what it used to be like and I understand that the buildings aren't in perfect shape there right now. I, I understand that, you know. Um, but I, I remember what it was like back in the 80s when I was taking the train into Boston to work and, and then thinking about the way it is now and then saying, okay, this is going to be gone. This is gone if we approve this project. And, you know, the way it dwarfs the 
depot, I thought today of my father and his model railroading kits that he had in his basement. I mean, they took up the whole basement, right? Um, but the, the depot itself, the train station, is going to be dwarfed. The park is going to be dwarfed. Experiencing those areas is going to be significantly different. Um, so I think that there's that, that's a big part of uh, how I first initially started thinking about the project. And then thinking about what this mass is going to bring with it, and I understand and I give you know, a lot of credit to the hard work of the, the Traffic and Parking Commission. I think that's probably a thankless board to be on, okay? Um, because it's tough, and any development you have, you have to weigh everything. But let's face it, if we're taking, we're quadrupling the block, we're putting 106 apartments, we're bringing retail there, no matter how good a job that you do at trying to mitigate it, the fact is the traffic is going to be much different than the way it is right now. And the, the park experiencing that is going to be squeezed. Every, the, the parking for regular people, um, it's going to be tough. It's going to be a challenge. So, you know, that was another thing, a big concern that I had. And the third, and, you know, I think people will probably take issue with the way I, um, I uh, phrase this, but it's an exclusionary project, which is ironic because we're talking about using inclusionary housing credits in this. But this is an exclusionary pro project in my mind for a couple of basic reasons. One because that anyone who lives in the census tract 2174, and this is the data I um, showed, anyone who, any household making the median income, that's 50% or below, okay? 50% of the people who live in that area will not be able to afford even a studio. Not even a studio. And 50% of the people, the households, the households that live in Beverly are not going to afford anything but a studio. This is a luxury project. Is this historic district, does, does this call for a special permit, a special vote, special consideration for something that is so unavailable to half of the households in Beverly? I, I know that we as a city have to look at housing and look at development and I know that we have to look at our tax base. I know all of these things. I do. We have to find a balance. But I think in this historic area, in this historic place, in this historic time, we can't let history disappear. And we have to pay homage to the history of the buildings, their use, but also to the people who live there today and who've always lived in this area of the city. And for that reason, I'm voting no on both special permits. Other members of the board who wish to comment? working okay great um, I have a question possibly for the chair for Darlene um, so we're voting um, on one we're not taking the special permits out separately we're having one vote is that correct it's one per okay but you, it, the motion was made as one whole so we can't right okay so I just wanted to clarify that because I was listening to the to the motion I think the other piece I want to say um, as a resident of Ward 2 and someone who has lived there for 20 years and has seen the area, that, that I'm not coming to this decision lightly. I think that I, I actually came to sit on this board because of housing. That was what made me come here. And I appreciate the applicant, um, you know, putting forth 12 um, units, credits, um, not only the number, but the depth of them. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I still sit with the unease of not one unit in this building being affordable. Um, 
but I do appreciate, you know, when I think about Andrew DeFranza and what he said is like, we always want inclusionary housing, except if we get deeper pockets and more units, right? So I, I've been sitting with that, still some um, unease. I, I think the project is beautiful and I appreciate the applicant's ability to take some suggestions and incorporate the CASA building. I think that that was, that was great. Um, but I still think of what else could be incorporated with those buildings. So um, I do, I've heard lots of friends, family. I appreciate we've had not only all of those letters, but uh, uh, th two to 3,000 signatures against the project. I, I've, I've been sitting with that too. Like what is my charge sitting here and who do I represent? So um, I, I just want to kind of say that, that this is a very deliberative, I've, thought, and I think everyone on this board has thought deeply about this because this is the gateway to our city and we, I see this every day, um, commuting back and forth. So um, that's all I'm going to have to say. And a couple comments. Sure. So obviously I made the motion, get the ball yep. starting, started so we can have this discussion. And I think from my perspective, how do I look at this, given my background, um, as a lawyer, I believe that we are charged with looking at the special permits. That's what we're looking at right now. We have a special permit for parking. We have a special permit for height. In order to grant those special permits, we have six criteria that we are called upon to evaluate. I enumerated those. Um, we talk about specific um, the specific site and the appropriate location, talk about property values, talk about traffic, things of that nature. And I think it is our charge uh, as a planning board to apply those criteria to the application for the special permit. We're not yet on the, the inclusionary housing aspect. And I want everybody to understand that the inclusionary housing aspect of this project is not a special permit. The applicant is asking for us to apply a specific uh, aspect of our inclusionary housing ordinance in this city to this project. It's something that has a, a, a program that has been developed by the city. That's not a special permit. That's not subject to these same criteria. Right now, what we're looking at is does the applicant, has the applicant satisfied the six criteria with respect to the height and with respect to the parking? My perspective. The parking is the, um, the least onerous of the two special permits. They're going to have on-site parking. I think that the data we've been presented with from parking and traffic, as well as the traffic engineer, as well as the, the everyday data of how many cars they're seeing on their properties, uh, one vehicle per one bedroom makes sense. The amount of parking on-site appears to me they meet all of those criteria, as I cited in, in the motion. With respect to the height, I think that we had a very robust discussion regarding the tall buildings guidelines. I think those are, we saw, uh, open to some interpretation. We heard from members of the community as well as from the team as to how to apply those. I, in my opinion, I feel that the team has taken those, the applicant has taken those into consideration um, has satisfied those requirements. Um, I would agree, and you've all heard me say in meetings earlier that I find this to be rather dense, uh, but I do agree that um, it is an appropriate location for dense housing given the train station, given the fact that we're looking at one bedrooms. I feel that the market here is for commuters and for young professionals, um, and so I brought forth the motion to get the conversation started. Um, and I just wanted to point out what I think, you know, hearing, you know, what is our role? I think our role is apply those criteria. If we get past the special permit, then it will be a question of discussion, discussing the housing, which again is not a special permit. Thank you. Thank you. My thoughts on the Depot Square application as seen today are positive. I believe the applicant is working within the parameters of the City of Beverly's design guidelines for tall buildings. The design guidelines are just that, they're guidelines. 
the applicant is working within these guidelines to best enhance the continued development and continuity of the appearance of Rantoul Street. That said, having lived most of my life in Beverly, I've seen changes within the city unfold as a citizen as well as a planning board member. Growing up in Rileside and now living in North Beverly, I can speak to change and how difficult it can be for some people as well as the benefits of change for others. I also remember what Rantoul Street was like when it wasn't the most welcoming of streets. I believe the redesign of Rantoul Street has brought a resurgence and a new energy to this neighborhood, a part of the city that has been relatively dormant. When the Depot Square 2 application was first presented, I was concerned with the mass of the building, its, its initial design, and not incorporating the history of the area as many fellow Beverly citizens had spoken to. After multiple meetings and much testimony, the applicant heard what was said and has made changes to the plan. Today, with the changes of the setback of the fifth and sixth floors, the mass is not as overwhelming to me, enhancing the look of the back of the building at Pleasant Park and River Streets. The plaza-like entrance to the building opening onto Ran Railroad Avenue and incorporating the Casa de Luca building into the plan has created a project that I can support. Anyone else? I will say this that Derek sure. sorry um, right. just a couple things um, Ned you made a really good point I mean and you know it's funny I decided not to read what I wrote um, earlier um, about uh, the uh, condition the, the the findings and uh, I've, I failed to say that the findings that at least I, I um, delineated actually mapped to especially finding number one um, which is in the uh, um, the motion that the specific site is an appropriate location for the pro proposed use and that the character of the adjoining uses will not be adversely affected and that's where the mass that's where the congestion that's where that those changes and then and where the luxury aspect of it and maybe I use a broader definition than others and one thing I also realized I, I forgot to um, mention um, is there was a, a gentleman, uh, Mr. Robert Moser, um, who spoke at one of our hearings, I think, back in September. Uh, he's a veteran. He's a single father. He um, grew up in Beverly, um, and he lives close to where this project is, and he he said he was concerned about development um, and the type of development that we were putting in the city and the pressure it was putting on people like him who felt that they could no longer afford or finding it very difficult to afford to live here. Um, and he wants to stay here, but he's being priced out. He talked about the ripple effects that Depot 2 is going to have on him and the thousands of other people who are within that radius and you know so i view that as an adverse effect as well um so i just wanted to be a little more lawyerly perhaps but thank you uh, yes thank you uh just briefly i i echo what uh, mr barrett said about focusing on our role and I, i'm frankly uh dumbfounded by the notion that seems to exist that um, a no vote on these special permit requests will somehow help with preservation of historic downtown Beverly or help with, um, with affordable housing. It, it, that notion fundamentally misunderstands with the choice that we're being fundamentally misunderstands the choice that we're being presented here. The reason we are ha having this discussion uh, and have had, you know, eight public hearings is because, because of the applicant's uh, need, at least as they currently conceive the project, for these special permits. The choice is between this project with the special permits and whatever the owner of this property uh, wants to do and is lawfully allowed to do with the property without needing the special permits. It's not between this project and 
you know, a, a uh, fantasy world of historic preservation of downtown Beverly or a fantasy world of somehow affordable housing is going to appear on this site. Uh, that, that's, that's fiction. Uh, the choice is between this project, uh, it, and you can make the choice that you'd, you'd rather roll the dice and ha have whatever the alternative is to this project. But it's between this project and an alternative project that this owner or another owner of this piece of property could build without anybody having, you know, being able to scrutinize, you know, what uh, shutters they've chosen. Um, and so, you know, to echo the idea that we need to focus on what we're being asked to do, we also need to focus on the reality of what the what our role is and what the choice we're making is um, not uh, not simply to imagine that if we say no that uh, it will it will help promote ideas that uh, we think should be promoted it, it may be that we should do that but but voting no uh, on this project does not does not create a single additional unit of affordable housing, does not help with the historic preservation of downtown Beverly. I will say that I think I've been on the board for 10 or 11 years, something like that. And this by far for me has been the most difficult vote even more difficult than the Whole Foods. And I, if I had to guess, this project is probably, in terms of the level of community interest, probably functionally equivalent to what the Cummings Center was. I wasn't on the board at the time, but I suspect it's probably akin to that. I literally have spent hours thinking about this. I was driving somewhere and suddenly found myself in Gloucester because I had gotten lost in thought about this. And <laughs> when 2,000 people sign a petition, when we have 78 letters or however many letters, when, when so many people come out here, it has to mean something. And part of what we are charged with doing, I think, is representing the interests of the people. On the other hand, we have to balance that need with the needs of the city. A, a, a need to, for a city to revitalize itself, to, to grow. As Ms. Flannery said, and, and I agree, there is, a, there is an energy now to Rantoul Street that there hasn't been in a while, to use a, a term I think the kids use, there's a vibe to it. Um, I do share the community's concern about the scale and the mass of this project. To me, and I, I don't think this is news to anybody, I, to me it's, it's, it's too big. But the applicant, the team, has been very responsive to the inputs from the community. And it does fit with the other buildings in the area. And the fact that it's on that corner, and at least, for the, at least marks sort of the end of that large or that height development on, on that section of Rantoul Street, to me, was important. The other part that's important to me is that I remember when, when this process started, I said to somebody, we need to be bold here. We need to be willing to take some chances. We need to recognize that this is a gateway entrance to the city and the design ought to reflect that. And I think through all of the iterations, I think we have that, that boldness. I think it's a project that I pray turns out as, as wonderful as that, that rendering and all the renderings are. It's, I've lived in Beverly for almost my whole life, you know, elementary school here, the whole high school, the whole thing. 
and I came back in 94 to put down roots and, and I'm here. And I always remember as a kid that how difficult Rantoul Street was and how, how just how difficult it was and how blighted that, that, that section was. I took the train to college for four years and back and forth every day going past that, that corner and seeing the, seeing the press box um, in a dilapidated, rundown state. My wish is that, and, and I think we have the commitment from the developer, that they will, they will recognize and honor the history of this, of this district and, and the significance that it played in, in the development of Beverly. And based upon that, and I think what I believe is a, is a bold design, a, a, a good design, albeit still a little bit too, too big and too massive for me, that, that I will vote in support of it. Um, I support this project on its own merits, but I, uh, I do share the concerns of uh, Mr. Besh that a no vote does not magically find us in a fantasy world where we have three beautifully restored, historically valuable and important buildings. The applicant has by right jurisdiction to build a far less desirable product. And on behalf of Beverly citizens, I'm not ready to roll the dice here. I'll support this project. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, all in favor? All opposed? Motion passes, special permits granted. Would you like the mic again? <laughs> okay. uh, moving on to the inclusionary housing permit 17-19. I would move that this board grant the inclusionary housing permit number 17-19 to apply quote credit unions previous credit unit units previously allocated by planning board special permit number 16-18 for 461 Rantoul Street and special permit 14-17 for 2 Hardy Street to count towards the housing affordability requirements for this project as allowed pursuant to section 315-14 of the Beverly Zoning Ordinance, whereby the applicant has committed to restrict 12 units as affordable, where nine units, where nine affordable units would be acquired at 60% area median income. Right, N yes, to be clear, nine is the requirement and they're going to hold 12. Is well, that right? Nine at 60 with your Right. Um, Four, okay. Four, four of the units at 461 Rantoul Street are restricted to 60% AMI and the remaining two are restricted to 80% AMI at Hardy Street. Uh, all six units are restricted, at Hardy Street, all six units are restricted to 60% AMI. Have that right? I didn't read it very well. Okay. So in summary, it's a motion to grant the inclusionary housing permit uh, to allow credit units which are housed offsite Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Barrett, seconded by Ms. Flannery. Is there a discussion on the motion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion, motion passes, special permits granted. Oh. So, right. <laughs> Finally, I would uh, move to approve site plan review application 140-19 pursuant to section 300-98 to construct a six-story 166,400 square foot mixed use building containing 106 residential units and 9,000 square feet of commercial retail on the ground floor with 106 parking spaces in the CC zoning district subject to the same conditions applicable to special permit 172-19. Is 
Is there a second on the motion? Ms. Flannery. Discussion on the motion? Derek? Um, yes. Uh, in light of the, um, you know, this is it. I think we could probably tell what's going to happen. So I think the drum is already rolled or something like that. But um, I'm hopeful that um, that maybe we vote this as a sec as a uh, um, something separately. But I'd like to uh, revisit the Beverly Historic District Commission um, uh, condition. And I would propose that the wording be changed um, to what was proposed by the Depot's Matter, um, Depot Matters Group. Um, and that wording is the developer shall consult with the Beverly Historic District Commission to develop an agreed architectural treatment that evokes the building's appearance during the period of significance for the Odell Park National H Register District. These elements shall be incorporated into the Casa de Luca building rehabilitation to present the building in st the style of that important stage of Beverly's history and railroads were critical to the city's development and defined this area as an important 20th century urban center. Such elements will be incorporated into the building finishes at completion. So, well, no, actually, I, 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 it says with any additional, um, it, 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 with any of the other um, conditions. So I'm offering as another condition is when I know we're not going to amend it that we would append or add this as a definitive condition um, in the vote. So, so what I understand is, is that I'm being asked to amend my motion. Um, respectfully, I'm not comfortable with doing that and mandating um, uh, in creating a condition which mandates their compliance with the Historic Commission as set forth um, in that comment letter and, and requested um, by, by Mr. Beckwith. Respectfully. Uh, do I want to understand. So do I make a motion to amend your um, motion? to add this, or is there no way to add this at this point? I, I would think parliamentary that there is a way to, um, at this point, that we're, since the, uh, the vote is motion to approve site plan review application pursuant to this, da, 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 subject to the same conditions applicable to special permit 172-19, and the following additional conditions, if anyone, any, and I would add this as a condition. That's my motion. Process um, to amend a motion, um, whether you're adding conditions or um, rec recommending changes to conditions, it would need to be a motion to amend the already made motion. So you would need a motion and a second and then you would need the, the board to carry that motion to amend it. So he needs a second on his motion to amend this motion. Is, is there, there a second? Is there a second on Mr. Beckwith's motion? I can't come to you. There's, there's no second on your motion. Okay, Miss. Okay, so we have a motion from Mr. Barrett. We had a second by Ms. Flannery. Is there any further discussion? This is a motion for site plan review approval. Discussion on the motion? A further discussion on the motion. All in favor? All opposed? Motion passes. I know that there are some who are unhappy with tonight outcome. I hope that you can recognize that this has been a, a, a very thorough process, a very well vetted process, and I hope we can come together as a city to support the project. Thank you. Okay, can we, no, five minutes, not ten. It's,